Sapor Ness. Uh, Sapor Ness is the president of the Royal Society in the United Kingdom and also head of the Francis Crick Institute. And um, he's done groundbreaking work on research into how the cell is regulated. And um, in 2001, he received a Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine, together with Leland Hartnell and uh, Tim Hunt. Paul, welcome. Good to speak to you, Barry. Yes. I want to go back a bit and um, what exactly made you want to be a scientist? Well, I'm not quite sure um, when I decided I wanted to be a scientist, but I do remember that I was always interested, even as quite a young boy, in the world around me. I got interested in a natural history and astronomy and walking to school, looking at the animals and plants. Um, and I think it was that, that sort of exposure to the um, natural world and what was going on around me that started my interest in science. So it was a growing interest and uh, so I think then you went to Birmingham University to do your undergraduate degree? I did. I actually had quite a lot of trouble getting into university because um, this was in the late 60s and I managed to fail the basic examination in French actually, we're speaking in Nice here, on six occasions and um, I never passed it but Birmingham changed its rules to let me in, so I, that's how I got into university. And then in the 1980s, um, you discovered that yeast and humans, that they share a common gene which uh, controls the way that cells uh, divide and grow. And that must have been a watershed moment. And, uh, so I um, asked one of um, my postdocs, Melanie Lee, and when she came to the lab, she said she wanted a difficult project. And I said, well, we could try and go for the human gene if it exists. Um, that is equivalent to the yeast gene. Now today we know that actually there's a unity of life um, and that many genes are held in common between yeasts and flies and worms, even plants and, and, and human beings. But at that time that was not the case. It was before we'd sequenced lots of genomes. So for her to take on that project was really quite, um, quite risky. Yeah, sequencing was very laborious at this time? Tremendously laborious. I, uh, when we cloned the yeast gene we had to have sequence it. it, it took over a year to do um, two kilobases of DNA. You could probably do it in about 15 milliseconds now, so it, it, it's a completely different type, um, situation. And what was the excitement like in the lab when you... It, it was really, really exciting because what Melanie um, did in the end, we tried various approaches, most of them fairly conventional and they didn't work, and then we used an unconventional approach, which was to take a, um, a mutant in yeast that was defective in this gene and therefore couldn't grow and sort of sprinkle on the yeast cells um, human genes. And um, if a, there was an equivalent human gene to this defective yeast gene, we reasoned that if it was taken up by um, uh, uh, some of the yeast cells, they, it could then substitute for the defective yeast gene and allow them to grow. This is called sort of cloning the gene by complementation. Uh, to expect those genes still to work was just, you know, asking a lot, but it worked. We got colonies growing, Melanie got the gene out, she got it sequenced, by then we could do it in about a month, it, uh, but even so it took a month. And when it came out on the computer, I just went utterly wild, utterly jumped. wild. I jumped, I ran around, I ran around the lab, I ran around the building, I told everybody. They all thought I was crazy anyway, but that confirmed it. Mm -hmm.